was. Israel was sprinkled. Moses went out and sprinkled blood on them. Now I'm thinking that's not very clean today. Today you would have to, you couldn't do that today. If you have one tiny little drop of blood in the school system, they call out 911, okay, everybody get back. And they put this thing and you got to pick gloves on. Because the, the blood is very, you know, it's very dangerous, very dangerous. So in this case, they sprinkle the blood and the value of the blood was actually put on the people. And you thought that it's supposed to cover their sin, but it never really took it away. So the sprinkling is meaning to cleanse by sprinkling or purifying. It's, you're purifying it by the sprinkling of it. That's, that's the intent of that word. In verse 23, so let's hold fast. It's like, if you get a hold fast, when we cross the street with my son when he was young, to hold fast. Is it his job to hold on to me? Or is it my job to hold on to him? If it's, if it's my job really to hold on to him, then I'm going to hold on fast. That's the picture of the image of hold on fast. To the profession of our faith. Now here it's saying our is in italics again. So let's read it without. Let's hold fast the profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful that is promised. You can hold fast if somebody is faithful to promise, and I promised my son I would hold him. Now, I would not ride a roller coaster with him because I was a little bit terrified of that because one time I went up there with him, and, and he, once we got up, we went up, I went off, I went off, and it was too late. Oh, shoot. And I said, I promise you, Hold on tight. I can promise you we will get off this and we will survive this. And he still didn't believe me. He still we had an accident on the way down. Okay, I won't go into details. But he kind of, you know, had an accident. I'll leave it at that. But he held on fast. And I had in my hand, I thought he was, you know, Superman because my hand was a little numb by the time we got off. When we got off, I said, did I tell you? I promised you. If you held on fast, nothing would happen. And he goes, yes, let's go again. No, no, not again. <laughs> I'm still on the ground, still moving. And I felt like a little bit like the Pope, I guess, when I got off, I kissed the ground. I was just oh, a little shit. Bit. <laughs> No offense to the Catholics, but that's, the, that's, what, that's what I felt like. That's the idea. If you're holding fast, because they're not going to waver. Dad didn't lie. I promised you we'd get through this. Besides, if the roller coaster had crashed and we'd both been died, would I have to worry about it? Too? I wouldn't have had it. <coughs> but I'm not going to do this. Here, here the, here's an idea that let us not consider, and let us consider the one another, pardon me, to provoke unto love and to good works. Provoking, I like the word induce. It's like you have a coal, if you have one little tiny coal. Now here's somebody that says, you know, I like, I like, me and Jesus got this thing going on. And we really don't need church. We, it's just all about us and him. We have a great relationship. I said, okay, well, let's take the coal out of the fire and set it over here. Eventually that coal is going to go out. But if we are provoking one another, we are keeping each other going. That's kind of the idea of this is. Provoking one another is meaning inducing one another. And if you take one out, it's going to die quicker by itself. You are, and let us induce one another into good works. This is a paragraph because here next it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. Not forsaking, for if you forsake someone, you mean you've abandoned them. you deserted them. If I had forsaken my wife and abandoned her by leaving her, and I think in 1 Corinthians 7, some people have abandoned them and they've left them and they've left their mates. That's the picture of this. So you think the writer of Hebrews thought it was pretty important to gather together in the assembly, in the body of Christ. Let us consider one another 
to induce good works, the works that are producing work. You cannot produce good works by yourself. For the church in general. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. The assembling means the gathering together of one place. Assemble, that's what the word assembly means. You know, we had assemblies in school. We had no choice. We had to assemble. And the assemblies were, for a lot of reasons, we had, you know, he's saying, don't abandon the assembling of yourself in one place. Don't do that. That's an imperative command. It would be like if somebody's out on the road and you've got a young child over there, so you just get out of the road. So it's an imperative command. It's the same command given in the same verb that Jesus gave in the Great Commission to go. So it's a, it's a put in as strong a sense possible. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Ourselves together is a plural form, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. Exhorting means, uh, I love the three e amigos. You know, I'm not talking about the three you know, three amigos, the three e amigos. Exhorting, encouraging, and edifying. Those are my three amigos. That's what we need more than another. The exhorting is meaning, if you exhorted someone, the word exhort means to call someone to your side. So, it's the picture of the Lone Ranger, at least he had Tonto. Okay, he was a Lone Ranger, but he didn't go along. Exhorting means to call someone alongside another. That's why we need each other. That's why when I pray, I pray that thank you and I thank God for you all and that we need one another and we need each other and we need prayers. That's another reason I try to determine to pray more often because I know we need each other. Nothing that ever big will get done without prayer. That you're never going to move forward except on your knees. So, let's not forsake or let's not abandon our gathering together with all the others calling each other along the side and we're cheering each other on. So much more. How much more? So much more. Even more so. It's not so much more. But how about even more since we see the day approaching. In verse 25, I see the day should be a proper now, it should be a capital D. The day. Is it in yours? It should be the day. You know what that day is. The day of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord. It's the second coming of the Lord. So even more so, as you see the day. And the word approaching means drawing near. It's like the prodigal son. Here's the picture of the prodigal son. He's seeing him. And you know what? He sees him and he sees, hey, I recognize that, that shape. I know who that is. I see him approaching. And that is an idea that we should be watching even more as the day is approaching. So in other words, the closer it gets, the more we need each other. The, the more we're going to need to stay together and be a team. The devil is wanting you to do just the opposite. For if we sin willfully, now here, here's an interesting break because it's talking about one thing assembling together as a church and now it says for, which you could say because. It seems like there shouldn't be, there's not a natural continuation. Why is it saying for if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sin. He's putting this together in the same paragraph of it as assembling together. If we sin willfully, almost, if you can look at it this way, willingly, intentionally, you did it on purpose. You have set your will to sin after you've received the knowledge of the truth. Here these Jews were sitting in church, or they'd seen the miracles of Christ, or they'd seen that, that Christ died on the cross. And you know, it was not done in the corner. Remember the, the road to Emmaus where Jesus talked to the two men? 
Jesus said, you know, where, what are you guys talking about? Uh, have you been out in Jerusalem? Have you not heard? Where have you been? A lot of you have been on that was the island. You know, they think, haven't you heard? It was common knowledge. So they surely knew. They had known the truth. They had heard the truth. Maybe they had seen the truth. He is the truth. If you've done that and you willfully sin, still at that time, there is going to be no more sacrifice for sin. That's a harsh, cold reality that if you did not trust in Christ and you've seen it time and again, and I think more than the United States, more exposed to the gospel, we are more culpable or responsible because we've been more exposed to the light. We've seen more of the light. We're more responsible for the light that we still walk in darkness than someone who has never even heard the name of Jesus. So it is saying if you if we sin intentionally and we set our will to no. do it after we've known the truth and we've been exposed to the God Christ of uh, the, uh, the, the Word of God, then we have no excuse. There's no sacrifice going to help again. It's not going to help you because you've rejected it. You know God said at one time He goes He reaches a point where neither will I contend with them anymore. There is a point that God says, you know what, I'm done. But a certain fearful looking for a day of judgment. Day of judgment is that judgment where he separates the sheep from the goats. And you know what? When they're young, when they're growing up, sheep and goats are kind of hard to tell apart. When it's really hard to tell. You have to be an expert to be able to tell. So, in, in that sense... The person that says, you know, I am a Christian, yet does not have the fruit of that. And it says, well, I have, I'm, we have the gift of healing, we have the gift of, you know, all this other stuff. And he's, I said, Jesus said, you'll know by the fruits. Okay? Worry about the fruits. If you're talking about the gifts, I would rather worry about the fruit. Because he said, you will know them by the fruit. So all we have to look forward to is rejecting the knowledge of, of God. And you continue to sin willfully. Intentionally, which is a reference to 1 John 3. 1 John 3 is a litmus test of whether you are a believer or not. 1 John 3, when many people say, you know, my, my, my mate or so-and-so is, is a Christian, we're having difficulty, we're doing it, that's just, you know, but I believe he is. I said, read 1 John chapter 3 and see if that's true. And then determine if the fruits are there to show that they are. There's only a certain verse 27, Hebrews 10, verse 27, of fiery judgment and indignation which will devour the adversaries of God. In, in other words, he's going to devour the adversaries of those who reject God. That is the adversary. If you either are for me or you are against me, there is no fence. The fence goes one way or the other. There is no fence. To be neutral is to reject Him. I am spiritual, but I do not believe in... I believe in God, but I have not, you know, really... Been, I believe in Him, but I know God is a God of all. He would not send somebody in the You created a God in your image. Verse 27. They have the only to look forward to a fiery indignation which will devour... Those who reject Christ. That's basically what verse 27 says. You know what devour says? <laughs> devour? Why is he saying devour? Here's maybe why. In Mark 9.46, you don't have to turn there, but you can maybe mark that. To me, Mark 9.46, my index didn't give me that information. What that made me think of was Jesus. They will devour them. Where Jesus said, where they are rejecting Christ, their worm never dies. You don't remember Jesus talking about judgment and He's saying that, you know, they will be cast out into the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the worm never dies. You know the perfect language for that. The, the, actually, what He's saying, He isn't saying it, that it's actually quoted this way, Mark 9, 46. Their worm never dies. So that that's a little fearful. I guess it, the Bible is, is 
it afflicts you. It kind of makes you uncomfortable at times because you cannot hold back. It doesn't. God doesn't say, "Well, you know, I'm a God of love, and I can't give a part of this." It is. It is full throttle. It, it's a little bit fearful at times to read. That's what the word "devour" means. A fire indignation which 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 shall eat them up, and a worm. That's what this is. And it kind of made me think in Mark 9:46. In Hebrews 10, verse 29, and I'll try to finish up with chapter 10, perhaps, because I can already tell with a sinus infection, I'm getting ready to lose my voice. And I have to check lost and found and maybe before I go back here, because I've got to work today, and I've got kids to yell at, okay? In verse 29, anyway, verse 28, I'm sorry. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy. Under two or three witnesses, now, how much more worse punishment do you suppose will he be worthy who has trodden down or underfoot the Son of God? That means they have trodden down, they've profaned it, they've rejected it. They've maybe even used it as a cuss word. I was watching cable last night, I was surfing around, I was trying to watch part of a game, and I was doing homework, and then I'd go back to Bible study, and then I'd... And I saw like a, it was the movie channel. And it's an interrupted, and uh, what is it? Uh, not TLC, but I think it's something like it. Not, no. Anyway, it's a movie channel. The, the movie classic channel. They have a show that G D this and, and, G, and G, Jesus Christ that. I said, how can that be on cable? In a, in a small town where I live, and on a cable, when any young child, can, I says, you know what? Five, ten years ago, twenty years ago, they would, they would have cut, they would have cut it off. You can't, believe, couldn't even show it on TV. Now here it is in prime time on cable, which can be access to most anyone, any age. And that is profaning God's name. He will not hold them guiltless who, who profanes or uses His name. How much more those who trod underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant? Where he was sanctified, an unholy thing. You're basically calling it unholy, unworthy by rejecting it. And has despised, and has done this despite the Spirit of grace. Now, in other words, verse 29 is saying, you've done it despite the Holy Spirit telling you that, the truth. Romans, uh, 1 and Romans 2 says, we're really having a work without excuse. Tying back again into our Bible study this morning, we don't have an excuse. We have a conscience. It tells us the truth. Verse 31. Again, I can hear Jesus saying this too. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, I have to be honest. There's times when it's past my mind that I wonder, God, if, if I'm, if I'm going to fall into the hands of an angry God, am I going to fall into the wrath of God because I didn't fully trust and confess and repent. That, and that, that's why I think I tend to want to do it every day. And I think it's a, a little bit of fear is a good thing. It doesn't overwhelm me. But it makes me, it keeps me humble. It keeps me from presumptuous sin. It keeps me from presuming, trampling, making no effect the blood of Christ. So you know what I'm saying? I don't ever want to take that for granted. And so when I fall down and I, sometimes, Today, this morning, I was a little bit cold, and I was a little bit, I have a sinus infection, I'm a little bit sick, and not a catchy, feely, touchy kind of thing, so we should be okay here. But I, I prayed in my bed, and I prayed on my face, and I put the covers over me, and I still ask for forgiveness, and God to bless the message, and to, and to thank God, and to forgive me of my sins, to show me those things that I have done that I'm not even aware of. So I want to, I want to keep that in mind that I'm not taking that for granted. I don't ever want to take, I don't ever want to take my wife for granted either. I love her and I tell her I love her and I tell my children I love her every day just because I'm not taking it for granted. Because if I walk out the door to work, will that be the last time I think I said I love you? I hope it is the last thing I said. In verse 32 in Hebrews 10, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great 
fight of affliction. Part while you were made a gazing stock, both by approach, reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. In other words, you were made fun of. You were kind of spurned. You know, I went to Newman University, and it's supposed to be a, well, a religious university. You know what? That they, I, there was probably not one twenty that I that I spoke with that were really born again believers. Because I tried to say, what did you come here to Newman because you know you're a Christian and you believe in Christ? It says I came here because I got a scholarship. What do you believe in? Well, I came here because my parents were Catholic. What did you come here? You no, know, I came here to be a nurse. So, you know, when I, when I did that, I found, I found that stigma that, well, that revealed who I was, that I did believe, because I, I was kind of telling them who I was. It was not a lot of people who wanted to sit next to me after I said that. And it was my way of opening the door, opening the conversation to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way. That's, that's what I did. So, we're willing to be made a gazing stock, which made me a laughing stock, basically, for his sake. Verse 34, you had compassion of me in my bonds, took joyfully in the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance, an everlasting substance, a crown that cannot perish. The basic was what I say. Verse 35, so don't cast away your confidence. Don't throw it away. Don't throw your assurance away, which is great recompense or paying back for a reward that you have earned someday. Not, not that you're saved by that, but that you're saved for that. You're not saved by works, but you're saved to do work or for works. <coughs> Verse 38 in Hebrews 10 now. The, and it, here, this is one of those things that you see through all, all the Bible, from the, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. But, if any man or woman, and here you can say, but if any, but if you draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If you draw back is a meaning if you refuse to believe. That is the, that's the intense there of that. If you, the, the translators, when they translated the Greek, and some of it was in Aramaic, I told you last week that the Greek is all one line, continuous, no periods or dots or anything, and it just ends. How would you like to translate that? No, good luck with that. It's going to be hard to do. So, if you were saying it this way, the just will live by faith, but if you refuse to believe, I have no pleasure in you. That's basically what you're saying. Jesus is saying, he has no pleasure if you take your hand back from the plow. It's the same thing. It's the same form just shall live by faith. But if you draw back, did you really have faith? Did you have faith? You're trusting in your own hand because you're coming back. I don't think you really did. But we are not of them who draw back under perdition. We, the saved, I think he's saying we. Who's he talking to there? He's saying we. And I think he's talking about those who he is convinced. We're not those that are not going to draw back or those who are ref not refusing to believe under perdition unto them that believe to the saving of the soul. Perdition. Remember, who was the son of perdition? Jesus. Judas was. And he oh, was, Judas. I'm sorry. And, so, and Judas was the son of perdition. And perdition means uh, as a state of condemnation oh, and of know. judgment. I'm sorry. And, and it's just kind of a fancy word. There's an English word that uh, saying he, he was set. It was determined ahead of time. Yeah, Jesus knew that he was not going to be uh, a disciple. He, he was a son of perdition. And what's amazing about Christ is he still washed his feet. He, even knowing that he was going to betray him. Is that hard for us to do? Maybe that's why I said pray for your enemies. Jesus prayed for him. That's, that's hard for me to believe. That just shows you how much God, how de deep is the love of God. And let me just touch on, on that one bit here before I go into 
too much into Hebrews 1. There is a great definition of Hebrews 1 of faith. What faith is you? He's just talking about. See, there shouldn't be a chapter there. Because in Hebrews 10, 38, he talks about the just kind of love by faith. They live by faith. They believe that it, faith is a living, active, believing, walking belief. And then faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the proof. <coughs> It comes from the Greek word, the hypostasis. Hypostasis is a, it's a compound word. It meaning it's a firm foundation. That which has an actual existence. You know, faith has got a firm, it's a firm foundation. It's not a, I sure hope that is there. I believe it is there. I hope the Cowboys win again this year. It's not that kind of, it's a, it's faith that, you know, is based on hope. You know, you drive over a bridge every day, and you don't go up in there and look, and you don't check the tensile strength of the metal and the sheet line, and you don't check for the rivets and see if they fall. Somebody else does that. You drive over there having faith, otherwise you're not going to drive over there. Oh, I'm not going over that bridge. You have faith. You don't need to see it. You just know it. It's absolute concrete evidence. That's what faith is. It's a substance or grounded confidence of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is meaning, all right, Your Honor, I'd like to introduce Exhibit A. We know this bridge is going to hold people up, so we pulled the garden beam, the beam out we brought it here into the courtroom. I don't know how it actually fit into the courtroom, but this is evidence in Exhibit A. This is proof. This is evidence that this bridge is going to hold you up. And you know, the judge is going to say, you know what I did? You didn't need to bring that in here. I could have believed it. You could have taken a picture of that. Yeah. And you know what? I would have believed it. I don't have to see it to believe it. I know that it is. But, but sir, Your Honor, this is the evidence. This is the real, actual evidence. That's what it's saying here is evidence is the evidence is proof by that which has been tested or proven. Evidence has been tested, ran through court, they put fingerprints, they did DNA printing. That's what the word evidence means. Literally, it's a proof by which the thing has been tested. So Abraham's faith was tested. Don't kill him. The angel of the Lord said, grab him. He passed the test. The evidence is in. You were going to sacrifice your son. That is he, That is faith. It's evidence. It's not, I hope, I hope, that I wish, let's pray for it. I certainly hope this works, you know. Right. And it's like, it's not like an invincible bridge. And once you take that first step, it wasn't Harry Potter or something. I don't watch a lot of that, but I heard somebody, they took a, they had to take the first step and the, and the bridge would show up. That's not that kind of faith. This is a faith that stands on evidence of the sure word of God. And the word of God cannot be broken. It's inerrant. And God cannot lie. And he cannot deny himself. Through faith, we know. And here, here is to me is a great description. Uh, we go back to the atomic age. You know, in Ecclesiastes, it, it, it talks about there's nothing new under the sun. You know what? We know that the earth existed. We know that things are made by things that we do not see. Through the report of faith, Verse 3. We know, or we understand that the worlds were made or framed by the Word of God. Okay, we knew that. Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. Also, 1 John 1 through 8. It talks about, you know, all things were made by Him. And I think it also in uh, Galatians, it talks about Him. All things were made through Him. And it's all through the New Testament, too. The worlds were framed by the Word of God. So that which we are seeing that I see are made by things that do not even appear. Now, wait a second. Is that a contradiction? You know what? It, you, can you see an atom? No. You can't see an atom. But you see the evidence of that. Right. The things which you're seeing are made by the things which do, they don't, they appear, they don't appear, we can't see them. The subatomic particle structure, and inside the atom is a cork. And inside the cork, there's even something else smaller. And how that doesn't fly apart, I don't know. They don't really know. It should just go, Phew. We, I know, we know. The world of God sustains and holds it all together. 
the Word of God. And if he'd have taken away his Word at one time, everything would have flying apart. It would have been, you know, splattered across the, the universe and plasma and just would have never ceased to exist. And so let me conclude here. And I'll start next time with Abraham in verse 8 from chapter 11. Well, I'm going to finish this here. And this is why it's going to be hard. To please God without faith. And this is where I really struggle. In verse 6, chapter 11, without faith, it's not really hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be somewhat problematic. No, it's impossible to please God without faith. Because if you come to God, you got to believe He is. First place, you've got when you come to God, you got to believe He is a God, and you have to believe He is there, even though you can't see Him. You know He exists because you have faith. You have concrete evidence. For he that comes to God has to believe that He is. Otherwise, what are you doing, wasting your time? That's not faith. And he that is rewarder of them, that if you diligently seek Him, He's going to be diligent in rewarding you. And we'll talk about Abraham's faith next time because Abraham's faith was. That was faith in action. It had faith with feet on it. And it walked. And like any walked with God, that is the faith that walks with God because we have a belief in God that we can believe and cannot lie and is able to perform anything that we, if it's His will, to pray for. And that's why I pray for you pray and for those who have not yet put their trust in Christ. And let's pray for that right Righteous God, thank you for today and for each man, woman, and child today. We're so grateful for you and the substitutionary penalty that was paid by you, that only the, through the blood of the Lamb can we enter into the Holy of Holies, not boldly or with cockiness, but in great humility. But we are confident in the fact that we have access to the throne of grace. We ask you to be with each of us this week. And to bring those who are not here, bring them safely back to us next week with those visiting family. And where you know that you can watch over us. And we give you the glory, praise, and honor for all things we pray in Jesus' holy name.